Are you ready to make more money? By listening to today's podcast, you will learn what to say and how to say it to up-level your influence and income. The small tips in this episode are guaranteed to change your sales approach. Don't miss another educational episode from the Fitness Business Podcast. If you just found the Fitness Business Podcast, welcome to the family. We have over 500 shows in a variety of topics. Head to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com so you can browse our catalog. Now, if you're a regular, thank you. I really appreciate you coming back week after week. If you like today's show, head to iTunes or Spotify to tell us about your experience. Well, hello there. I hope you are having a productive day. I'm your host, Dory Nugent, and thanks for joining me today. Founder of Sales Maven, Nikki Rausch, believes it is time to ditch the pushy sales strategies. Today, you will learn that in order to be successful in sales, you need to sell by combining selling skills and kindness to earn their business easily and effortlessly. Curious to learn more? Well, in just a few minutes, our episode will begin. First, a huge thank you to MyZone for supporting our show. MyZone has pioneered unique wearables with talking point technology that makes the difference. Reach more members of your community and keep them engaged for longer through motivation and gamification wherever they choose to work out. In the gym, at home, or outdoors, We're stronger together. Get in the zone at myzone.org. Thank you, MyZone. Make sure you check out www.myzone.org. Get your pen ready now for MyZone's Fitbizpiration. All right, Nikki, I'd love to hear your top three tips for successful sales. Well, first and foremost is practice creating curiosity so that you pique people's interest so you have more business conversations with your ideal clients. Second tip is be really clear, stand in your place of credibility and authority and recommend what that person needs or wants, like what your solution is that is going to meet that need or want and make sure you follow up with a really clear, closed statement. So it allows for that person to decide, do I want to buy this thing or not. Be really clear in your clothes. Podcasting to grow your business is next week's topic and industry expert Kelly Smith will be joining me on the mic. Kelly is the host of the successful podcast, Mindful in Minutes. And after this week's full interview, I'll introduce you to her and you'll hear why you need to set a calendar reminder for next week's show. This podcast is brought to you by Hapana. Hapana is a cutting-edge membership management solution prioritizing insane engagement. Hapana puts your brand first so you can facilitate deep, meaningful connections with clients and members to book, pay, consume content, and build community. Hapana partners with fitness brands in both the boutique and big box segments that want to drive efficient operations and maximum engagement with clients and members. And they do this by providing direct world-class support with a passionate team who cares about your success. To see how you can transform your brand, go to Hapana.com and ask for a demonstration. Hapana, engineered for engagement. It is time to get started with today's episode. All right, we've got sales guru Nikki Rausch with us today. Nikki is the CEO of Sales Maven. Nikki, thanks so much for joining all of us here on the Fitness Business Podcast. Thanks for having me. I can't wait for this conversation. Oh, I like the energy. So I've been told that you have a unique ability to transform the misunderstood process of selling. I like that. Thank you. That is that is absolutely what I believe to be true about sales and about my approach to sales. All right. Well, we're going to talk today about your approach to sales. And honestly, my first question right off the bat really is, you know, how does relationship selling differ from traditional sales 
methods. I mean, especially in the fitness business, we we really try to create that culture of community and relationships. I think the traditional approach of selling it teaches people that it's your job to convince people to buy from you. And when you go into convince mode, oftentimes you are talking at people. And when you think about relationship selling, relationships to me are about being collaborative and it's about community. So I say this is that sales isn't something that you're supposed to do to another person. It's something you do with another person. So instead of trying to convince people to buy, your job is to create real conversation. And that means having with conversations. That means having back and forth between you and the other person, even if you're communicating via email and, you know, and sending out broad emails to your whole list, there should still, it should still feel like a real conversation that you're selling to a person and you're not talking at them, you're talking with them. Myself, I was a sales director in the fitness industry for many, many years. And I always had zero success if I felt as if I was coming at them with commission type sales breath. So I really appreciate that quote that you say, and I'm going to say it again, just because I think it's fantastic is sales isn't something you do to someone. It's something you do with someone. I love that. It's It sounds more like a journey than a process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've never heard anybody talk about commission breath. I'm going to take that away. I love that so much. Thank you for sharing that little nugget with me. You got it. <laughs> Brilliant. That's what we're here. We learn from each other. So this is great. Um, let's talk about the steps of an effective sales process. So my signature framework for a sales conversation, I call it the selling staircase. I did write a book around it and it's a five-step process. And the reason I teach it as a staircase is that most people understand that you move from one step to the next. You don't stand at the bottom of a staircase and try to hop up to the top step. Now I know in fitness, that might be an ultimate goal is like to be able to do these big leaps and use this strong core that you build. But in most staircases, you understand you go from one step to the next. So the five steps to the process first is the introduction step. The objective there is to make a powerful first impression. Step two is to create curiosity. This is the most misstep in the sales process. Most people don't think about do you know how to create curiosity when you're talking about your offers, when you're talking about your gym, when you're talking about what it is that you can you can do for another person? Once you've created curiosity, step three is that discovery process. That's understanding, does the person have a need or a want? And in the discovery process, your job is to ask really smart strategic questions that plant seeds for the other person to go, ooh, I'm talking to somebody who who knows something or can provide something that I want in my life. And then step four is the proposal. That's actually where the selling happens. This is when you're laying out a really clear next step offer for somebody of like how to meet that solution or solve the problem that they're saying they're having. And then step five in the process is close. And that goes really closely with step four. This is the second most missed step. This is actually where you're asking for the business. You're issuing the invitation. And I find most people that are not closing as much business as they would like to, or they're saying, gosh, people are ghosting me or people said they want to buy, but they didn't buy. Oftentimes it's because you're not having a really clear close. I agree with you 100%. In our sales training, we used to always say, let's just break it down to ask for the sale. So many times you you go through all these steps and you kind of tiptoe and you're nervous. And it's like, well, did you ever just downright ask them for the sale? <laughs> and, you're, and most people are like, well, no, maybe I wasn't very clear. So I appreciate that you're saying you got to be clear. Got to be clear. So step number two, Speaking of create curiosity, you've created my curiosity on how do you teach uh, sales folks to create curiosity? Is it wording? Is it painting a picture? Is it painting a journey? There's a couple ways to do it. And I'll give you the way that I think will maybe resonate with your audience the most, which is it does take practice. And the thing about building, it's like building a muscle, right? And muscle takes practice to build. It's repetition. So it's learning how to, it's it's the way that you answer questions. Oftentimes it's the easiest way 
to create curiosity. And I often compare this to the difference between how you call a dog versus how you call a cat. So bear with me here as, just to, as I explain it because I know it sounds a little, a little wacky. But the thing about when you want to call a dog, a lot of times you you change your energy. You do this thing where you're like, come here, boy, come here, right? And dogs kind of respond to that energy. But unfortunately, people are not dogs. And so when you're super excited, you've got a prospect and you know they're a good fit for your gym or you know they're a good fit for your program and you come off with what what I call dog calling energy, people will push away. They'll go like, oh, too much. Like it, you're coming on too strong. So if you think about how you call a cat, when you want to get a cat's attention, you would never call a cat like you would call a dog. You wouldn't be like, come here, kitty, come here, kitty. Because that's too like frantic and like... But you do this thing where you go, here, kitty, kitty, here, kitty, kitty. And right, and cats don't always even come to that, but they'll give you enough of their attention. So how do you answer a question that might create curiosity? So for instance, really simple, again, we're building muscle memory here, is think about how do you answer a really basic everyday question like, hey, how are you? That's a simple question, right? But you might have a standard answer like fine or okay, but that doesn't create any curiosity. What could you say that would open the door for the other person to be able to ask a question? So you could might maybe say like, oh, I'm great. We're just about to launch a new promotion. Now, if you said that to me, I'd be like, what's the new promotion? What do you do? What does that mean? So what could you say right now about your business that would pique somebody's curiosity and allow them to ask you a follow-up question. That's how real conversations happen. And through conversation, that's where we can start to determine, are you talking to a prospective client? Are you talking to somebody who'd be a good fit for your program? So think about how do you answer a question? Give a little bit of an answer that would allow somebody to go, tell me more about that. So in our sales training, we used to also teach a lot about if you ask them, let's just say they that you ask them straight up right as soon as they come in, would you like to join? And they say, no, or I'm not sure. And I'll, I'll include myself when I first started. You'd be like, oh, okay. And you'd kind of just shut down. That was the end of it. And we really were trying to teach our staff to like keep asking questions and keep engaged in a conversation. Don't just accept that they said no and just turn around and walk away. Yeah. And I would even say, based on what you just said, I would love for somebody to ask a question like, hey, have you ever considered joining the gym or have you ever considered signing it? versus a like, do you want to? Because that is a straight, straight up yes or no. But have you ever considered? It's still a yes or no question, but it kind of plants that seed of like, oh, well, if I haven't, maybe I should. Great. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's talk about this is pretty popular in the fitness industry. We're always trying to figure out, you know, what kind of offerings we have. Do we offer a a low price, minimal amenities? Do we offer three tiers? Do we just offer one high end price? So what are your thoughts on that? I know you talk a lot about you should have a high end offering. Well, I do love the idea of having a high-end offer. And the reason for it is because it creates an anchor for your other offer. So I'm not saying only have a high-end offer. And even if you want to only have a high-end offer, then you should probably have three high-end offers. But if you create an anchor and when you're laying out the ways that people can work with you, you want to do what's known as top-down selling. I feel like you probably are familiar with this story, but top-down selling. So you're going to talk about the most expensive option first, and then you're going to work your way down. When you create this anchor of this higher tier, this is the all-inclusive, this is, you know, whatever it is, but it's the like, it's the, it's the diamond level. And then you talk about, you know, so here's the diamond level, here's the step down from that, here's the step down from, you know, the mid tier. Most people will say like, well, maybe I don't need the diamond level, but they don't like to have things taken away. So when you talk about this like big offer, and then you talk about this next tier down, they're probably more inclined to pick the middle tier because nobody wants to have all the, like lose all the things and just go with the basic tier. But if you start with the basic tier and then you try to sell them on the next tier or the next tier, like more expensive, it just sounds like you're adding more things. They've got to pay more money to get more. But if you do it from top down, your higher tier 
it's like, oh gosh, I'm giving those things up just to save a little bit of money. And they're less likely to pick a tier that's not a good fit just based on price. And so we want them to pick the solution that's a best fit for them. So you do want to have a higher tier anchor. So is that kind of in connection with what what you refer to as upselling and downselling? Yeah, so upselling is, well, it's a little different in that an upsell to me is like once somebody has bought something from you, you want to have a next thing they can buy. So that's the upsell. And you can, and an upsell can be what's what's considered an and offer or an or offer. So an and offer would be like, hey, you just bought this thing and you can also buy this other thing. Or you can have an or offer, which is, hey, you just bought this thing if you'd like to upgrade to this other thing, it includes what you bought and all these other things. So that's what an or offer is. And it's super powerful to, to offer that when people are in buy mode, they've got their credit card out or they're ready to like sign the contract. When you can put that in front of them, they're much more inclined to be like, oh yeah, I want that next level. A downsell offer is is also the opportunity when somebody has said like, gosh, that's really out of my budget. So instead of just like, do you want to buy this? Yes or no. If they go, gosh, that's out of my budget and you have a a tier down, a step down for them. It's like, well, here's a way for you to get started. And a lot of times when people pay you a little bit of money, they're much more inclined to pay you a little bit more money down the road or for that next thing. So sometimes it's just getting people in the door. So don't ever be afraid of having a downsell offer either. Mm, I like that. Good advice. Always hear about the upselling. So I was curious to hear what you had to say about the downselling. Good, good takeaways. Awesome, Nikki. Now, you're kind of known for teaching how to sell successfully and authentically, right? So, (laughs) So what are some of the key phrases that you like to incorporate when you're talking about the sales conversation? Well, one of the key phrases actually is more for, this is one that I'm really known for, is when you're communicating via written communication. So if you're sending someone a DM, a text message, an email, one of the things that you want to look for is get a lot of your I statements out of your messaging. So it's really common, like we have a thought, we think it in our own terms, and so then we write things from our own perspective. Unfortunately, that is not interesting to a reader who doesn't have a lot of rapport with you, doesn't even maybe hasn't even met you in person before. So when you send a statement of like, hey, Dory, I want to tell you about this new offer, like Dory might be going, well, who are you? I don't care what you want. But if I instead can frame things in the form of a question, that makes it more interesting for your brain. So it's not about what I want. I might send instead a question like, would you be interested in hearing about this offer? That allows your brain to go, oh, actually, yes. So so two things here I just offered is in your written communication, you want to get rid of as many of the I statements as you can. So a rule of thumb that I often give people is count how many sentences you have in your communication, your written communication. And then count how many I statements that you've written. So, and a, and a we statement also counts if you're talking about the gym or you're talking about your team. A we statement also counts as an I statement. A we statement doesn't count if I'm talking about me and you, the reader. That we statement is fine. But if I'm just talking about my organization or my company, we counts as an I. So, if let's say you have 10 sentences, you should really only have up to it's like the 80-20 rule. So 80% should be about the reader. 20% can be about you. So 10 sentences. If you have more than two I statements in that in that message, you're, you're probably going to have a lot of people just deleting and moving on. And so kind of the second piece to this is learn how to, instead of making statements, because that's talking at people, put things in a question form. Now that's talking with people. So written communication, and this one also works in a face-to-face. I often tell my my people who I train on sales, if you're not sure what to do or say next, ask a question. Is there anything else that you recommend when communicating? 
asking for the business, which I think you even said earlier, is like teaching your people, like ask for the sale. Don't ever be afraid to say to somebody, what would it take to earn your business? Or is this something you'd like to get signed up for? Or what's what's the best next step in order for us to get a time on our calendars to work together, or talk about working together? Don't be afraid to ask the question. And, and that means asking for the business. And I love how when you say that, your voice changes. Like you get a little excited there. Like, hey, you know, doesn't this sound great? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You want it, You want it, people to understand that, yes, you want to earn their business and you're excited about it, but not come off so strong of like, you should really buy from me and here's all the reasons why. Because people go like, oh, too much, Nikki, too aggressive. <laughs> that would be the dog calling, right? That's right, exactly. <laughs> Well, Nikki, before we wrap up today, is there anything when it comes to the sales process or asking for the sale, is there anything else that you can think of that would really benefit all of our, our sales crew out there listening today to the Fitness Business Podcast? Here's what I will say is after listening to this, if you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure I've ever actually asked somebody to work with me or I've invited them to take that next step with me, follow up with that person and issue that invitation and see what happens. Great advice. And listen, you kind of just sparked one more question from me. I'm going to just kind of come off here with one more. Let's just talk about you get the sale. How do you teach your salesmen and women with the follow-up, you know, a week later, a month later, I know we don't want to just drop off the face of the earth. So what advice do you have for just staying in touch with them after you make the sale? Well, think about things that would be interesting or useful to that person. And just even just a touch base with them of like, how have you been? How are things? What's new with you? Ask again, asking questions. And, you know, here's a great follow-up question is, what is one thing that I could do right now to be a resource to you? Just even asking that, it shows that you care about the person, you care about the relationship. And oftentimes they might come back with a crazy thing of like, hey, can you find me a house painter? Which might not be something that you could help them with. But at least you plant that seed of like, I'm here and let's stay in touch and don't be afraid to reach out to me. FBP family, I hope you enjoyed Nikki's episode and I want you to know that it's an honor to spend 30 minutes of your day with you. I'm going to assume that you have a follow-up question or two for Nikki, so I've posted her contact info on the show notes, which can be seen at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. And while you're there, click on that subscribe button so I can send you the show notes to you each and every week so you don't have to Google them. <laughs> Coming up in 30 seconds, our quick Fire 5 segment with next week's guest, Kelly Smith. G'day, it's JT here. And I was talking to Blair McKaney, the CEO of one of our sponsors, MX Metrics, the other day. And I gave him a hard time about his company's tagline, defeating mediocrity. By definition, that means he's excluding the majority of the market but Blair just wouldn't budge. He only wants to work with operators who want to punch mediocrity in the face, really smash it. So I've talked to a few of his customers, like Joe Shirelli from Gainesville Health and Fitness, and yeah, it's for real. While Joe is a nice guy, he isn't satisfied with mediocrity either. He's crushing it as well. So I'm still dubious about selling only to operators who want to defeat mediocrity, but if this resonates with you, I reckon you should check them out. Go to mxmetrics.com. But remember, only if you're interested in smashing mediocrity. Quick Fire 5, sponsored by Hapana. I am excited to introduce Kelly Smith to our Quick Fire 5. Kelly Smith is our Quick Fire 5 guest. Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Hey, we're going to learn a couple fun things about you. We're going to actually even get a book recommendation from you, and then you're going to get a chance to pitch your episode for next week. So let's get started. You ready? Let's, I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. What is your top guilty pleasure? Cupcakes. 
cupcakes, vanilla, yeah. chocolate. What kind of cupcakes we got? You know what? I like I just uh, as a kid, I called it white with white frosting. And it is still just my go-to, especially at 28 weeks pregnant. Can't say no to a good cupcake. I really <laughs> like them. <laughs> I like that. Can't say no to a good cupcake. You can't. All right. So while you're eating that delicious indulgence, how about an habit or action that you're also doing to be productive? I like to make a to-do list in the morning every day before work, and I like to keep a running list of things that need to be done immediately that are coming up and things to keep an eye on that are a little farther in the future, and I build my day around those three categories of things. All right, good advice. Now, how about an activity that calms you? Meditation. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, <laughs> it's the truth. You had to say that. <laughs> I, I mean, it is truly, it's, it's the thing for me. Perfect. All right. Now I'd love to hear what book maybe you're reading right now or recently have read that you'd love to recommend to all of our FBP family. One of my favorite books ever is called The Yamas and the Niyamas by Deborah Adele, and it dives into the first two limbs of yoga. And I think it's really beneficial to learn about the depth of yoga beyond just the poses. Well, thank you for that book recommendation. We have not had that one before, so we will make sure we get a link to that in our show notes. Perfect. All right, Kelly, it is your chance to invite all of our FBP family to your episode next week. Well, I would love to have everyone if they want to come and learn all about how to maybe launch or sustain a podcast that is going to speak to your audience. Podcasting has absolutely changed my life. I've been doing it for five years and I have been able to reach millions of people doing it. So I'd love to show you how to do that as well. Warrior Instructor Academy provides relevant and original Group X instructor certifications. Warrior Rhythm is for those who crave the benefits of yoga, but prefer a fast pace, high energy, and a big beat. Warrior Strength is a brilliant blend of mobility, weights, and hit designed to help us live life better, more fully. Warrior Combat is boxing inspired. Its gritty vibe focuses on combinations, conditioning, and confidence. Give your members the gift of safe, effective, license-free programming designed for everybody and every body. Warrior formats are edgy, uplifting, and empowering. Change more lives at warriorinstructors.com. We all know that podcasts have become a popular source for education, but they also can help grow your business and your brand. Come back next week to find out if podcasting is the missing link for your business success. I look forward to spending 30 minutes with you, and I want you to subscribe to the Fitness Business Podcast on your favorite podcast player, or you can subscribe at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com so you won't miss the show. See you next week. Thank you to our founding partner, Active Management, our partners, Hapana My Zone Body Map, and to our advertisers, Rex Roundtables and MX Metrics. We believe what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others.